Ponce uh, Nursing Home in St. Augustine. Please keep her in your prayers. Again, we are glad you're with us. We're fixing to go into worship service. Please, would you bow with me with a short word of prayer? Father, we thank you so much for us being in the family, your family. Be with us today as we worship. Be with all the men as they lead in this service today. May we all worship as you have instructed us to. Bless us. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Oh. 
Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty God, again, Lord, we are so blessed that you've allowed us this day, Lord, uh, another chance to come before you and to worship you, Lord, and we thank you for this. I just pray this morning as we lift up our prayers to you and as we sing these songs and as we hear another portion of your word, that this would be pleasing in your sight, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you would bless this congregation that meets at College Road. Lord, help us all as we continue to be out in our communities and at our work and the school and the different things we do from day to day, that we touch other people's lives and show them that this Christian life is the life to live that will lead to eternity with you, Lord. Lord, I just want to offer a special prayer this morning for the people of Ukraine, and as this conflict continues on, I just pray for them and for their safety, Lord, and, and Lord, that you would change the hearts of this leader of this country and this oppression, Lord, that, that he would stop this. Lord, I just ask now that you would guide and direct us as we live our lives, Lord. Just help us in the times that we fall short in sin to pick us back up and lead us to the right path. We ask this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred for such a one as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away, it was there by faith I received. Does everyone have one of the cups? 
as we prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper, let us think about just a portion, some of the suffering that he did just for us. Please open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. written hundreds of years before Jesus died. Beginning in verse 1, Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before his shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, as for this generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my sin, my people, to whom the stroke was due. Jesus gave his life for us. A scourging that was mentioned is where they take a, a short whip and they tie pieces of metal and bone into it and lay you over a rock and beat your back with it and cut your back open. He did all that for us. Let us give thanks. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for his love, for a love that we can't understand. Help us as we partake of the bread which represents his body. May we do so remembering what he did for us because of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for a love that we can't understand, for a love that we, don't un we just don't know, willing to give his life, a perfect life, that through his blood we can have redemption of sin. Help us as we partake of this fruit of the vine which represents that blood, remembering what he did for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. There's a basket at the back of the auditorium if you have not put in your contribution. You can do that as we leave. Let us give thanks. Father, we thank you for the blessings we have of living in a free country. Father, please help that the monies that are collected will be used to further your, your kingdom. 
Help us to be the examples that we should be. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> this will be our song before the lesson. Let's all stand, please. Seated, please. Good job. Good job. One of the great privileges of my life has been to come and to open the pages of God's Word to see lessons that I need and I trust you need. Timothy wrote, or Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Timothy, I have a message for you. Preach the word. The instant in season and out of season Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, they shall teach and heap to themselves teachers after itching ears. They'll turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. That charge, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Verses 2 to 5. Every gospel preacher has been given a charge. When I thought of that, I thought of the lesson for today. 
truth that transforms. Expository preaching is falling today on hard times. Many today are preaching at self-seeking churches. These are churches that seek to have the preacher preach about 15 minutes, followed by a drama that's very touching, and then everybody leaving just feeling good. Sin is not mentioned. Christian living is not. And that's the year, the yearly thought of so many. That's the mission of some churches. Beloved, I must declare the whole counsel of God. And every preacher that stands in this pulpit will give an account for what he has delivered. When we deny the power of God's word, when we substitute it for the thinking of men and for the thinking of our society, we fall into the text that we're going to look at today. The truth of Almighty God has an eternal effect. As we look at our text today, and we'll read it in a moment or two, it's found in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, and it's on the screen before you. I'd like to begin by saying that this is one of the greatest biblical texts on the power of God's Word. The author has in mind a problem, a problem that was with the children of Israel. It was the danger of cultural Christianity. The text that he really referred to is found in the book of Psalms, chapter 95. And that refers to the tragic problem that the children of Israel had. For a moment, remember this. They had come out of Egyptian bondage. They had wanted to come out. They requested to come out. And after they came out, various things happened. They had already applied the Passover blood. They had crossed the Red Sea. They had entered the land of the wilderness, and God had given them water and manna to eat. But they did not trust God nor obey his word. And as a result, the failure to enter God's rest, which is picture of salvation. Verse 11 says, let us labor to enter in to that rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. That is a message to us lest we too fall into a life of unbelief. If we do, the writer here says we're going to miss the rest. They missed a beautiful rest. There are three rests in this text that are important. The first one is the rest of heaven. And it says, there remaineth therefore, verse 9, a rest to the people of God. Beloved, I don't want to miss the rest of heaven. I can miss it with unbelief. 
And that's exactly what happened to them. In verse 10, there is another rest, which is the present rest. Listen to this verse. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his works, as God did from his. What is this saying? It's saying that Jesus completed his work, and salvation is now given presently for all of those who obey his will. And then he gives us a charge in verse 11, the present rest now. Let us then labor to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Are you going to enter the eternal rest? Israel did not. They had God. They had his word. But they disregarded it. They failed to trust God. And God said, it's time to enter the land of Canaan. It's time to enter the promised land. Why didn't they do it? There were three reasons. The first one was they thought that God had failed them. Remember they said, you have brought us out here in the wilderness to die. There's better graves back yonder in Egypt. What are you saying? God, you failed. They said, secondly, they failed to think that God would fulfill his promise. Promised them a beautiful land, but look here, we're not getting it. And thirdly, and this is very important, they thought they were going to have to do all this work of getting there, and they didn't want to do it. You remember what they listened to? They listened to some spies who said, Oh, my goodness, we visited that land. Why, there are giants in that land, and we're nothing but grasshoppers. We can't do it. You see what I'm saying? Wrong thinking begins in the mind. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, or out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 23 and 7 says, A man thinketh within himself, so is he. Wrong thinking leads to wrong action. That's the principle. Can I move from that time to now? We have today wrong thinking. You know what the thinking is? The thinking is that money is the answer to everything. There are people today that are living their entire life to acquire money. They get that money, and what happens? They die. They take it with them, don't they? No. They came with what? Nothing. And what do they leave with? Nothing. Wrong thinking. And look how many today are doing it. They're spending their time and their talent and everything they have to gain more every day. And the more they gain, the more they want. Wrong thinking. There's a second thing that we have today, and that is that we've got to take action against those that have wronged us. We've got to take action. Paul said in the book of Romans chapter 12, no. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will repay. We've got wrong thinking today nationally and in the world. And that is evident by what's happening in a country today that you know about. We prayed about a while ago. Wrong thinking. It will lead to destruction. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, that's the picture, folks. What can we do about it? 
the truth of God transforms our thinking. Now, this is the theme. The truth of this book transforms our thinking. Why? Because of three reasons. This is the theme of everything I'll say in the next little moment. We have the power through God to know that our sins are exposed. Our sins are exposed through the power of this book. Number two, God sees everything. We don't hide anything from him. The book says all things, and we'll look at it in a moment, are open to him. And thirdly, we need to be diligent to get our hearts right before him. Now that's the theme of the lesson. The word of God exposes my sins. God sees everything I do. I need to get my heart right so that I can be right before him. Now would you please turn, if you have your Bible, to the text and listen to the expounding of these truths that are powerful and will change our lives. Let me read. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Word of God is quick. One version says living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, a joint and marrow. And this Word is a discerner of the thoughts and of the intent of the heart. God opened my mind to the truth that will transform my life. There are five things he mentions. He mentions, first of all, that God's Word is living. I'm going to illustrate it this way. How many of you would have gotten up early this morning to come to hear me expound on Shakespeare? You might have come today, but you'll say, is he going to talk about that tomorrow? Next Sunday, yeah, I'm going to talk about Aristotle. It wouldn't be long till there'd be all pews empty. Why? Because they're all dead. But when I come, I'm looking at a God that's living. His word cannot be separated from him. It is a living word. And it can never be exterminated. Listen to Isaiah 48. The grass withers, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall what? Stand forever. What does this word of God do for us if it's a living word? It's living power in the word. There's living power here. How to live. You remember in John the 6th chapter, some of the disciples were leaving the Lord, and he looked around at his own beloved apostles and said, are you going to leave too? And Peter said, Lord, to whom would we go? For thou hast the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? We go here because of what reason? Life-giving power in the Word. Two areas I see life-giving power. I see it with dead sinners. God is the author of life, and He imparts life in two ways to all of us. First, when we're sinners. Well, somebody says, I think I can just live in my sin and go to heaven. No, 
A dead sinner can't any more will himself to spiritual life than a dead corpse can to his physical life. You don't have the power spiritually, and you don't have the power physically. Where is the power? Listen to his word. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. You have, you sinners, me, you've purified your souls in obeying the truth. Through the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart. Here's how. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That's the power, beloved. And that's the source, Jesus Christ. It has likewise an effect on all of us as children of God. It helps us as saints to be renewed. Listen to this verse. Psalms 19, verses 7 and 8. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord appear, enlightening the eyes. If you want to see a psalm that gives to you this concept, Go to Psalms 119, 176 verses extol the benefit of God's Word. If you have not seen it, you need to see it. The Word of God is living. He next says God's Word is active. And that word means full of energy. It comes from the word energy, from the Greek word active. It has power. It's effectual. And it intends to do what God wants it to do. Listen to Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. As the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but watereth the earth, maketh it to bring forth fruit and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereunto I sin. The Word of God is active. It's the revealed truth. It brings life, and it's the power of God. And, beloved, you read it. It will change your life. Third, how is it working? It's sharp. Hebrews 4 and 12, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, I did a little looking on that. Sharper than a two-edged sword. And I found the following. The double-edged sword was the sharpest in ancient arsenal. Nothing like it. Brother Keeble used to be a Wonderful old black preacher said, it cuts a going and it cuts a coming. I think he said it well. It is sharp. It has an edge. It cuts. And I want to tell you something about it. Sometimes this word is disturbing. The sharpness of it gets too close to the heart. It touches the mask of hypocrisy. And it hits the spot of our makeup that need to be probed. Now, here's a part you're not expecting. The purpose is not to destroy you, but to heal you. 
It's cutting. Why does he do it? Well, let me say it this way. Sin is like a cancer that's growing inside of us. Untreated, it'll be fatal. Let God's Word do the cutting. And he'll cut the sin of cancer out. And his word will be revealed. Why is it sharp? To get rid of that which is going to kill us. This is the truth that transforms us, folks. But he goes on. He said, furthermore, God's word is piercing. That means to go through. The sword pierces the heart. The heart is cardia. It's the central seat of our human being. And all of the cutting and all of the things we know are exposed before the eyes of God. And our deepest intentions and our most safe experiences are laid before him. I want to read Psalms 139 in just a moment. O Lord, verses 1 to 3, you've searched me, you pierced me, and you know me. Thou knowest my down sitting, my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compass my path, my lying down. And you're acquainted with all my ways. Finally, what does he say? He said God's word is discerning. What does that mean? That means he's a judge. He judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word judges means to divide or to separate. And then he says, and discerns to act as a critic or a judge. Now, we all know the work of a judge. We know that he is to impartially sit. He is to weigh and evaluate what comes before him. He sees it and evaluates it. His word is a judging. And I see it as I read it. And I understand the work of a judge. The work of a judge, he analyzes the evidence. What's been presented to him. He deals with the realm of our thinking. Our secret sins by the judge are uncovered and laid before God's eyes. He judges our reasoning power. Oh, thou hast searched me and know me. And fourthly, there is nothing hidden from the word of God. Let me read verse 13 now. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Look at the word open. It means to lay bare. It means to expose the neck. That's an interesting thought. Do you know what that means? That simply means that this particular sacrificial victim's neck is going to be exposed just before he slices the jungle vein. It's open. We're going to give an account, and we must be diligent to have our hearts right. Listen to this as we begin to close. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 to 10. Wherefore then we labor, whether present or absent, we must be accepted of him, for we must all 
appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive of the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it be good or evil. If you missed everything I said this morning, which I hope you haven't because the Word of God is powerful, I want to give you five thoughts for you to take home. You may want to write them down. I want to because I want to think about them. The powerful Word of God. What are the principles from the passage? Number one, view God's Word as medicine, not poison. Review God's Word as medicine. It's what we need and not poison. Number two, treasure God's Word above all worldly counsel. Treasure God's Word. It's more important than every man that's ever lived save Jesus Christ. No other man has ever died for you. No other man will ever raise you. Don't put your faith upon a man. It's not in man that walketh the directed steps. It doesn't matter how good a commentary he may have written. Come to the living word of life. Treasure God's word. Above all worldly counsel. Thirdly, meditate on God's Word. Know what it says and have the prayer. Touch my heart, O God. Touch me. And fourth, live with your heart exposed to God's law. What does that mean? It means upon thy law I meditate day and night. Yes, I know what's going on in this world, but I'm better be knowing what's going on in the mind of God so that I can change by listening to God. And finally, allow God's Word to change your heart and your life. It's in here, folks, that he addresses clearly what he would have us to do. It's here. He said, you have to believe in me. That's what happened to the children of Israel. They lost faith in him. And that belief leads you to being willing to say, you know, I really believe in Christ. He is the Son of God, and I want to confess his name before man. And my master's already said this in Luke 3 and 5. Except you repent, change your way, you'll perish. And my master said to go all into all the world and preach this good news. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be condemned. This is what he had have us to do, and he's also said, here's what I want you to become. And to become like Christ. One that is described with all of his holiness and power and righteousness. All of this on the sacred pages. That's what he said. And therefore, I'll close with the following statement. The living word of God. He calls men by the power of his word to the heights of the righteous life. And in reality, this book is a love letter. It's written to all human beings, conforming and confronting them of life, calling them to spiritual life, and 
beloved, pointing them to eternal life where there is the rest that he's talking about. My question today is this to me and to you. Has the truth transformed your life? Where did it come from? Look at it. This book. And may the words of his mouth and the meditations of my heart today be acceptable to him. And whatever changes I need to make, let's make them together we stand. Will you bow with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for another day that you've given us. So we thank you so much for this Lord's Day and what it means to each one of us as we gather here together as thy children to study another portion of thy word. Lord, we thank you so much for this lesson that we've learned, that we've heard today. And thank you so much for Brother C.L. and his willingness to stand behind this pulpit and proclaim the, your word. Lord, I pray at this time that you'll look down on the College Road congregation, and I pray that you'll be with this congregation individually, collectively. And Lord, I pray that this congregation, I pray that you'll bless the works that go on here. Be with our elders, Lord, and I pray that you'll look down on each one of them. Be with our deacons and the programs they represent. And Lord, be with the members here, and I just pray that this congregation will, will grow, will continue to grow, and continue to strengthen in thy word. Now, Lord, as we get ready to dismiss and go our separate ways, I pray that you'll keep us safe, bring us back at the next appointed time. In Christ's name we pray, amen. <laughs>